I've always been an outsider and really from my earliest years I felt that I was an outsider trying to get in, trying to forge a path, trying to make my way and ironically I ended up of course as speaker as a member of the establishment Dermot but I certainly wasn't chosen by the establishment and I think that also won't be denied or argued against by anybody. It was before you became an MP, but you stayed associated with it. You joined the Monday Club, this right-wing conservative association, and you're very frank about it in the book. You talk about that repeatedly uh, as a shameful period for you personally. Now, let's tell people about the Monday Club, and you were inspired in part by the, by the works, the speeches, the thoughts of Enoch Powell, who, who your dad originally introduced you to. It was a great mistake. I was probably a rather insecure and uncertain young man. I hadn't quite worked out what my future would be. I was probably a bit unsure of myself. I had been afflicted by a number of problems in childhood. I was physically a rather unimpressive character. And whether the sort of machismo of right-wing politics at the time particularly appealed to me, it's difficult to say. I'm trying to look back and decide. Anti-immigration, anti-Europe. It was a terrible mistake, and not just a mistake in the sense that in the end it didn't serve me well, but much more importantly than that, I feel to this day terribly ashamed that as a young man I joined what was essentially, to all intents and purposes, a racist pressure group on the fringes of the Conservative Party, and I gave encouragement and succour to people who were promoting racist messages. Some of those people you mentioned, I mean, you said it was racist, some of them still in Parliament and uh, some of them are still on the right of the Conservative Party. Are there racists in the Conservative Party now? Well, I'm not thinking of anybody in particular in the Conservative Parliamentary Party. I think that racism is a scourge which afflicts society as a whole. I think race relations are much better now, Dermot, than they were 20, 30, 40 years ago. But I think it is a continuing challenge across the political parties. We've heard quite a lot over the last year or two about the difficulty and the real evil of anti-Semitism in the Labour Party. I must say I've never encountered anti-Semitism from a member of the Labour Party, but I have encountered anti-Semitism from some members of my former party, the Conservative Party, and there's certainly an issue of Islamophobia in the Conservative Party. So I think really it is best for politicians in all of the parties to take a mature, level-headed and constructive approach to this subject, to accept that it does afflict both of the major parties and perhaps others, and needs to be addressed. David Cameron. Now, let me. I think we've got a, one of the quotations you have about David Cameron. Then are we back to are we back to class here with David Cameron? You, I mean, you give us a, very much a sense, and many people seem to uh, pick it up as well during his years as prime minister that he was rather entitled, and born with a silver trolley service in his mouth, sniffy, supercilious, and deeply snobbish, an opportunist lightweight. You didn't really rate David Cameron. No, not particularly. I think he's very able. I think he's very fleet of foot. He's very articulate. He can be charming. Now and again, on big occasions, on the occasion, for example, of the Bloody Sunday Inquiry report, he performed with great skill and sensitivity and dexterity. But if I have an overall criticism of him, I dare say he's got various criticisms of me, it would be that he was relentlessly tactical rather than strategic. He didn't have an overall vision for the country. He tended just to fly by the seat of his pants and to work on the basis that because he was skillful on his feet and because he had a good turn of phrase, he would hack it. And famously, of course, he was asked about the EU referendum. He said he would win, and I think somebody sort of said to him, why? And he said, well, I always do. Theresa May took over, and, uh, you know, Theresa May, perhaps given a hospital pass, the poison chalice, who knows, but this is your assessment uh, in part of Theresa May, and a lot of it was character. Decent, but as wooden as your average coffee table, dull as ditch water, lacking in an ounce of small talk, devoid of any spontaneity or natural fluency, let alone charisma. Discuss because she required a lot of what she lacked there, did she not, for dealing with the situation she inherited? Yes, I mean, that is the encapsulation of what I think of her. I think she's a decent person. I think she's hard-working. I think she's public-spirited. I think that all of those things are true, and I think that it is incredibly important to be a successful political leader 
to have the quality of political imagination. And I think Theresa May lacked political imagination. Boris Johnson, of course, uh, not too long in post, already won that thumping majority in the general election. Your, your assessment so far of him, and you know Boris Johnson quite well. I know you, <laughs> you mentioned in the book, um, beating him rather comprehensively at tennis. We'll get on to that in a moment. But the, let's just uh, get some of your assessment at his occasional best, a passably adequate politician. He's disproportionately preoccupied with whatever serves the cause of advancement for Boris Johnson. In it for himself, John? Well, he's hugely ambitious. He's been motivated throughout his career by the absolute unyielding determination to get to the top of the tree, and he has succeeded. Moreover, credit where it's due, he's proved so far to be a very successful campaigner in getting office. However, the real challenge is, having got power, what does he do with it? Will he deploy statecraft, not just for his benefit, but for the benefit of the United Kingdom? And there, I think, one has to say the jury is out. There were people who thought that if he got a big majority, and this is an almost humongous majority of 80 that he's got, that he would then rat on the hard-line Brexiteers and, in a sense, pivot to a soft Brexit position. And so far that hasn't happened. I mean, it's very much the opening salvos at the moment that are being fired. But in these opening statements and speeches he's making, he seems to be signalling very clearly that he does not want regulatory alignment with the European Union in the name of maximising market access. He wants to diverge from the EU and have the fullest possible scope to forge free trade deals with the rest of the world. He can do that, but if he does that, a, those deals will take some considerable time to forge, and B, if he does diverge, the chance of getting a satisfactory trade deal with the European Union seems to me somewhat reduced. And it could all have been very different. Let's just focus down now on that period after the 2017 general election. You've talked about that hung parliament, how you interpreted it, how Theresa May, the then Prime Minister, interpreted it very differently. Did you see it as your job to try to thwart the approach that Theresa May and her government were trying to take on Brexit, or were you simply informed by the fact that there was no overall majority in Parliament and that therefore all parliamentarians had to have a say? The latter. It absolutely wasn't my mission to thwart her or to thwart Brexit any more than it would have been my mission to facilitate or implement Brexit. That wasn't for the Speaker to do. The role of the Speaker in such a situation is to facilitate the House. And what I sought at every turn throughout my Speakership, not merely in relation to Brexit, but in respect of every other subject, was to let the House breathe. The particular difference post 2017's election was that the Parliament was hung. The government had no overall majority. And what from time to time I had to say to ministers and to the government chief whip was, look, it's not my responsibility to protect you from the absence of a majority. Now, I accept that I interpreted the rules in some cases differently from the way in which they'd been interpreted before. There were people, Dermot, who said, ah, what John Burko has done is unprecedented. To which my answer was, yes, the circumstances are unprecedented. I broke no rule, and in respect of the so-called Ben Act, passed by non-government MPs to protect Britain from a no-deal Brexit unless Parliament approved it, what I was doing there was letting the House breathe. My judgment was that I should let the House do what the House wanted to do. But you made enemies. Do. You made enemies by doing yes. that, oh, particularly absolutely. of those in government, and particularly uh, one then leader of the House, Andrea Leadsom. Um, just want to discuss that relationship, because it was crucial between the Speaker and the leader of the House. And uh, this is just some of how you've described what seemed a very, very difficult relationship, that uh, she had a near pathological hatred of you, uh, feeble and sinister. And this is very interesting. Um, just tell us a bit about this. I took care always to be accompanied so that there was an independent view on what was said by whom and when. This is when you met with her and you made sure that she had someone on, on her side. Independent witnesses, but why? There was no trust between us. And I was advised at one point by a senior person in government that she was very hostile 
and that she was looking to foment trouble for me. And that individual, who said this to me in confidence, and I will respect it, said to me, Mr Speaker, can I offer you a word of advice? And I said, please do. And he said, if I were you, I, A, wouldn't rise to the bait if she tries to wind you up, and B, he said, if you have meetings with her, because of the importance of it being clear subsequently who said what to whom, I would advise you to be accompanied. You also address other allegations, the allegations of bullying uh, made uh, while, you, while you were there by uh, sure. one of your clerks, Kay Dems, and your private secretary, Angus Sinclair. Uh, and are you mystified, uh, because you obviously deny the allegations, are you mystified as to, as to why they made them? Yes. Frankly, I was astonished when the allegations first surfaced nearly two years ago, I think it was in March 2018. At the time, nothing was said publicly by an individual to the effect that she or he had been bullied. Subsequently, a couple of months later, somebody came forward and said that he felt unfairly treated by me. I can say only two things. First of all, I absolutely insist that I have never bullied anyone anywhere at any time. Secondly, the overwhelming majority of the working relationships that I had over the years as a Member of Parliament, as Speaker, in the constituency office, in the Speaker's office and with staff across the House were positive and fruitful relationships. Since you've written the book, as I say, you, you address those allegations. There's two more have come out of them. The Lord is vain. Um, another senior clerk there in a black rod, David Leakey. And uh, we interviewed David Leakey last week. I know you, you're aware of the allegations, but let's just uh, remind the audience again. Uh, th th this, is what, uh, this is what the former black rod had to say. My opinion is that he brutalised staff in the House of Commons and elsewhere, m my, include myself in that. Um, I think he brutalised is a good word for what he did to Lord Lisvain, his private secretaries, David Nartzler, the clerk who took over from uh, Lord Lisvain, John Benger, the clerk who's taken over from him as well. Um, they have all told me in private moments um, some of their experiences at the hands of John Burko. My view is that he brutalised people. And it wasn't just those top people, it was people much further down the pecking order. And he tried to do it with others, politicians as well, who went into his office. Brutalised is the word used three times, I think. Total and utter rubbish from start to finish. I noticed how hesitant David Leakey was in developing his case, as though he was choosing his words carefully. Total and utter rubbish. First point is that David Leakey didn't work for me. He wasn't employed by me. He wasn't an employee of the House of Commons. He worked in and was the protocol officer of the House of Lords. He is in absolutely no position whatsoever to comment on my relations with my parliamentary colleagues, of which he is completely and utterly ignorant. He doesn't know what my relations were with my clerks. He has absolutely no intelligence on those matters whatsoever. What we've got here is somebody who left the House, who is thrashing around, desperate to remain relevant, popping up at every turn, trying to make himself seem very important, very centre stage, very at the heart of things in the way that I went about my work. None of those things, Dermot, is true. Absurdly, preposterously, he's turning up years later a couple of years after he left the House, commenting on matters that he can't possibly know about because he'd already left. He said something about my relations with Andrea Leadsom in May 2018, something that I'd allegedly said to her and caused her to cry. He wouldn't know. He'd left three months before. The guy is a know-nothing. He hasn't the foggiest idea what he's talking about. He was deeply hostile to me. He's entitled to his views, but on the matter of bullying, he suffers from the disadvantage of being 100% wrong. But Amen. Do you think there's an agenda here? Because we get now to... Um... Your, oh, Leakey your, your, has, your, Mr Leakey has admitted it. Yeah, you know, he's pontificated. I mean, it's very amusing in a sense because he works in the House of Lords. He's entitled to a layperson's opinion. The idea that he knows about what was going on in the Commons is ridiculous. But he's made it very clear that he thinks that I'm not a suitable person to go to the Lords. Well, we're very grateful to him for his opinion, but these are not matters for him. You would accept a peerage if given one. What's this about Jeremy Corbyn proposing you? Well, the Leader of the Opposition has proposed me 
for membership of the Upper House, and I must say that I'm very grateful to Jeremy Corbyn for that. And if somebody says, or if you're implying, quizzically perhaps, Dermot, well, why is it being done by the leader of the opposition? No, well, am. Jeremy Corbyn is doing it because he thinks it's the right thing to do. The government should have done it, and the government hasn't done it. That has been the norm for the last 240 years with every living speaker. There's no entitlement. I'm not saying it's a matter of entitlement, but it has been the norm, and I was given to understand that it would happen. Senior members of the Conservative Party gave me the impression that it would happen. They've resiled from that. And Jeremy Corbyn, who I think is very straight in these things, said, well, do you want the opposition to propose you? Because we think you should go to the House of Lords. So I said, yes, please do, if you wish to do so. And that's what they've done.